Hello everyone. So when exactly should you coach and when not? Now, there is a surprising number of reasons that speak for as well as against coaching, believe it or not. So stay tuned. This is the Coaching Leader Podcast, a resource for modern, busy people leaders like you who know that just directing people simply does not work in the long run. We provide focused skill practice and the relevant thinking models, so you will ask better questions and make your team shine. Freshly served to you by IntelliCoach.org from hot and spicy Singapore. Hello everyone, this is Mike again on the Coaching Leader Podcast. Today, as I said, we'll talk about some of the reasons that speak for and against coaching. Now, this is the Coaching Leader Podcast, and you might expect that I'll have a lot more reasons for than against coaching, but you will be surprised in the preparation for this podcast, I came up almost with more reasons not to coach. Now, that doesn't speak against coaching. It only shows I was more creative on the negative side. So let's see where we end up here. So when we talk of coaching, let's not forget we are talking of leader coaching. So what does that mean? We're not speaking of coaching as a distinct conversation where the coach reduces themselves and completely hands over ownership to the coachee. That's rather an unexpected or slightly rare occasion for a leader coach, I would say. Let's talk of coaching moments. And that means in our context, Leader coaches want to learn how to, yeah, push down thinking, but that sounds a bit, as it says, pushy. They want to help and want to invite others to develop their own solutions or their way to a solution. And coaching is really not delegating. Coaching means that we believe that the others or that our team members have ideas to offer and that we unlock our sincere interest in their ideas and that we can give them a chance to explore them and even to use them even if we don't fully agree. Now let's start with some of the reasons that speak against coaching. Let's get them out of the way. And I think the first and foremost reason why we might not want to coach in a specific situation is if there is one right solution. Let that sink in. So let's say you are in a meeting and you're discussing how to structure a presentation for maybe a high senior stakeholder group next week. And you know exactly as a leader what they are looking for in terms of structure and main bullet point items. There's no point denying that. There's no point in asking, so what should you think should be in that presentation? when then your people might start thinking and give you solutions but in the end you'll tell them no actually I think I know what needs to be in there let me share with you you know how that might feel if you do this and what people call that yeah passive aggressiveness very simple and people have all the right in the world to say and ask you afterwards why haven't you just told me why waste my time yeah, and it's especially harmful when you ask for their opinion and then you tell them what the right answer is. This can work in a training situation, but it certainly is not the right place for coaching. So your good judgment comes into place here as a leader to know whether there is really a black or white correct solution, an answer, or whether it is just your opinion. And very often we might be deluded in that way. We might think there is a right answer, but it is in fact just our opinion. And that can be a bit tricky at times. So that was the first reason. Then the second reason is, if there is one right way. Now what's the difference? Number one was if there is one right solution. Number two is if there is one right way. So let's assume for a moment we have that that solution fixed, right? So there is a certain element in the board presentation that has to be there. For example, they want to have a, a KPI review for, let's say, the first 10 minutes, and that's non-negotiable. Now, the question is, is there a one right way to deliver that and to prepare for that? That's more unlikely 
But maybe in our case it is. It is completely required. Maybe there is a complete specific way how to prepare this certain meeting. Maybe there is a certain implication to ask one, two, three, four stakeholders in that order and they expect it. So if there is a certain way, a certain process that is mandatory, and in many functions there is, then we have to follow it. So the question is always, if there's not much freedom to choose a path, then we simply have to align ourselves with the fact that we have to follow a given way. So if there's no one right way, that might refer to yeah, given processes or, for example, values too. If we want to start a new project and one of our values, core values is simplicity, then that guides us and we have to follow a certain way. Now, the coaching opportunity might be how to follow that principle of simplicity, but who knows? The third reason why we might not coach is if we are likely to save the other person a lot of time if we use our knowledge. So that would assume that we as a leader coach have at the same time a very strong functional background in the area of our team member, which is often quite the case. Now, if we know a lot and we deprive our team members with knowledge, then we shouldn't coach because it might feel like we are, we, are, we are back at school and that's not the point here. If it's about knowledge and skill, coaching has no right place because then we have a duty as well to the company to use our time well. If, for example, as an, as an opposing opinion, the company has a very strong stand in letting people find their own ways to absorb new information, oh, be my guest. But it's more likely that you want to save people time. And then when it comes to knowledge and skills, you just give them what it is. You train, you direct, you advise. So in summary, so if a person is not successful because of a specific skill or ability, coaching is just not the answer. So the fourth reason why we might not coach if there is absolutely no time. Now, I have to be careful with this here because there is no time is one of the most common objections why coaching is not compatible with the leader's reality. Now, we might very quickly fall into this trap to rationalize most of our situations as there is just no time for this. I'm too busy. But frankly, that might apply if we see coaching as a discrete, long conversation where we completely hand over ownership to all and everything to the other person. Very likely, you will make most of your coaching impact through one or two questions differently asked in an existing conversation that's on your calendar. So really no time rarely happens. We find that most people have the time to ask one question different or hold their horses maybe for one minute in a team meeting before they share their own solution. More likely it is because we feel compelled to retain control of a meeting instead of that. But let's assume now there is really, really no time and you're, you're just minutes away from a very important meeting or let's make it even more visual. You're out there in the field as a fire captain and you're outside of the building of the burning house, you wouldn't start coaching. You will start directing, you will advise because that's the right place to do. Now, when the action is over, you run an after action review and then there might be more time to ask a few questions here. So number five, there might be situations when everyone's alignment on the leader's opinion is just most beneficial. And that might be a, a cultural thing. So coaching might not work well if the organization itself is not ready for it. I'm seeing this a lot in Singapore here. A lot of the, the smaller and more locally managed companies, they show a lot of comfort in hierarchy. And that's nothing bad. It's just that all parties, leaders and, and employees are very comfortable in command and control systems. That means leaders are there to give orders and employees are there to follow them and everybody's happy. And that's fine. But if in this kind of environment you start coaching, 
by yourself and nobody expects it, you don't explain it, it's not a corporate-wide initiative, you will come across very likely as strange, at the worst incompetent. And people might wonder why is he or she asking so many questions. She's supposed to be telling me what to do. That's her job. What's going on? So be very careful when you introduce a coaching mindset in an environment that is not prepared for it. People need to understand what coaching is. and They need to participate. Coaching is a partnership to a good degree. Now, it doesn't mean a coaching leader in a small company that values hierarchy cannot start with very small steps. Yeah, a question here or there does not harm. What I'm saying is switching your style completely or radically from one day to another, mm, that might be something you want to think about. Another reason why coaching might not work is if there is very little trust or maybe there's even distrust. Because what happens then is if you go into a meeting and you discuss a project and you ask them, so what would you do? That question in a low trust environment is simply being seen and interpreted as something with an agenda. It's very simple. Low trust means we assume negative intent in the other person. So and when you start asking questions about other people's opinions, they will be very careful to actually share their own ideas, even if they are better than yours. So my advice in these cases is when there's low trust, to first check in with yourself and to ask yourself, what is that low level of trust based on? Is it something that I'm contributing to? Is it a sign of a symptom of actual bad performance? Because then other company processes might be more useful to go through first. But let's assume for a moment you actually want to rebuild that trust and, it's, and you're sincere in that. Then my suggestion is that we use some specific coaching skills first rather than the whole package. For example, we share observations in a more neutral partnering way. For example, we don't say, you messed up in your project. What's, what's wrong with you? We ask them, I observed that based on the status report that your project seems two weeks late. What led to that report showing up that way? I'm curious. Now, even that might show up as something slightly aggressive from the other person's point, but way less than a direct judgmental confrontation. And what otherwise is very important in this point is that we rebuild trust by being consistent. Consistent, neutral, and partnering. Now that's a topic for another, another podcast. So in number seven, coaching is actually not that useful if we only link it to problems. Coaching is not a last resort method to fix someone, especially if they are at the last stretch in the company. They are bottom quartile. They are being put on a, on a personal improvement plan. If you then bring them into a room and say, I've got bad news. Yeah, so the last quarter looked really bad for you. So I've talked with HR and you're now on a personal improvement plan. And yeah, you're going to get coaching. What do you think the other person will say? Coaching is a stigma then. And we absolutely want to get coaching out of that area. Nothing gives me more the creeps that if people say things like, Mike, you should talk to this person. She needs coaching. What that means, what they're actually telling in that moment is she needs to be fixed. And that's not what really coaching is for. Coaching can help in this scenario, but it's not very powerful in that moment. Because when we are in that situation, that we go to somebody who needs fixing, very likely trust is broken. And then coaching is not very effective or fast yet. Coaching works the fastest when trust is there when people open up and share their own ideas so we can ex explore them with them. If there is no trust, people close up like a clam and they will defend themselves. They will act in with fight, flight or response to your every single word. So be very careful though to try to coach with somebody who you have no trust with or who the relationship is broken. Don't go into a room with an employee who you have bad blood with. 
try to coach them, ask them powerful questions and they fire at you and then you say, see, coaching doesn't work. No, it was not the right moment for coaching. You need to fix the relationship first. And coaching might be a component to that, but it's definitely not a way of interacting that solves everything. And lastly, for completeness sake, coaching is not therapy. So when it might not apply that much to, to the leader coach and employee relationship, but I want to say this here for completeness sake, if employees, team members, we all bring our full self to our work. And sometimes poor performance is a result of something that happens outside of the office walls. You know, there might be something that comes up, a family issue of some sorts or something in the past comes back to us. Coaching is not designed to help and fix that. Coaching looks at the present situation of someone and tries to help them create a better future on their own terms. Therapy in, in contrast deals with the past and deals with trauma and how to resolve these trauma and that needs a very specific skill set. I am not I am not at all trained in trauma resolution and in diagnosing it. All I know is if a client is really stuck in their problem they are very emotional about it and they cannot release the past, then I say this is not the right place for us here. Coaching is not the right thing. I suggest you talk to a therapist first and find out how you can resolve that so you can move on, so you can actually arrive in the present because you're currently stuck in the past. And that's something that's very important for us to recognize too. Coaching is not diving into problem root causes. Because then also coaching will take very long if we call it that way. That's another common criticism. Coaching takes too long. But it's also because many people confuse coaching with understanding the root cause of problem and then fixing it with advising. Nothing could be further away from what coaching actually is. So let me summarize. So I've sort of picked up eight reasons for when we should not coach. Quite a long list, isn't it? So coaching is not that useful is not useful at all if there is one right solution. If there is a right way, if there's a right thing to do, say it as a, lead, as a leader coach. Don't beat about the bush. Then it's not useful if there is one right way. If there are certain processes defined and if there are certain values that guide us, then coaching is not useful if the person is not, not successful because of a lack of specific skill or ability. Then, Coaching is also not right if there is absolutely no time. If you're on a moment of crisis, then we emphasize the leader aspect in our leader coach role and we lead and we advise and we direct and command and we use this style because it's appropriate. Then coaching might also not be effective if the alignment on the leader position is more beneficial and if the organization is simply not used to coaching because then you will have a very uphill battle to fight. Then coaching might also not be as useful yet if there is very little trust or even distrust between leader and team member. In that moment, we should rather focus on finding ways to rebuild that trust with that employee. Coaching might be one component there, but by no means it's all. Then. Coaching is also, number seven, not a resort to fix somebody. If you start coaching only when somebody is on their, on their way out, then usually trust is already broken and things don't go the way they are. Now, coaching might help them accept and find the path forward, but it's not a problem solution tool for somebody on their way out. You should start way earlier on that part. And the last part here is coaching is also not therapy. If somebody is stuck in their past and they have really personal problems to deal with, they might not be ready to look into the future. They have not resolved their past. Therapy is a well-designed and mature tool for that. And we should all sharpen our eye to understand when a person might be benefiting from that a lot more. 
So we've talked about a lot of reasons so far why we shouldn't coach. And you might feel a bit let down at the moment because, my gosh, that's a long time talking about why we shouldn't coach. But gladly, there are many, many good reasons and situations when we should coach. And the first thing is, if there is liberty and freedom to choose a solution. For example, let's say, let's say a manager doesn't know how to deal with performance of their own employee. So should we coach that manager or not? I mean, there are two choices here. So if in one company, for example, a big MNC, they might have a solution for that. They might call it, in case of bad performance, numbers are not met, choose a PIP, performance improvement plan. That's the way to go. There's no choice here. You see bad performance, you call up HR and you do that. Company B might say, maybe it's a smaller company, SME, startup, who knows. They might say, we believe you managers make good choices. We trained you in our values. We believe you're capable. So manager, choose your own solution. How will you deal with performance? So it depends really on when there is liberty and freedom. So when there is a freedom to choose and when our idea of what someone else should do is just an opinion, then we might think, let me first hear the other person out. What they think is a good solution. It comes back to our last episode and we should ask them, so what is your recommendation? That is a really powerful question in that instance. Number two, when there is liberty also for a path to the solution. Now let's look at these, these both um, examples again. We have a coaching subject here, a manager who wants to deal with the bad performance of an employee. And in company A, they said, yeah, you have to use a PIP. So that's the solution itself, but the path to the solution might, there might be some freedom. So let's assume you're the leader to that manager and you ask him, so now knowing that you have to follow this PIP protocol, What's your next step? How will you deal with that? And the person might say that they will, they will start reading the procedures and then, then start talking to the, to the employee. And here you can really coach. You can ask them, so what might, what might need your focus in that moment when you talk to that employee and bring the news? Or you could ask questions like, what might hold you back? What could possibly go wrong? So you coach basically on the path, on the individual way. And that's very powerful because person A's way to implement that PIP procedure might be very different to person B. And you want people to find a path that excites them or at the least makes it acceptable for them to do it in their own terms. Now, another reason why we might coach is if there is simply a chance that the other person has already thought through and already might have an idea of how to approach something. That's the very basics. Because if we, if we go into a room with somebody and we, for example, we set up an urgent 30-minute call to discuss a project issue, we hop on a call and because of what we know as a leader, we have an idea what they should definitely do. Is it worth holding back at least one minute or two minutes and ask them, what would you do? What is your recommendation? Based on what you know, what would you do? Because there's really value in that for so many reasons that we've already discussed on this podcast. Very likely if people are in a difficult situation and they want our idea, part of it is also to make them feel comfortable. It's a shared responsibility then. But if you want to train your people in leadership, have them go out and share at least their opinion. Otherwise, they might simply fall back to that old command and conquer style thinking. They might go into the meeting with their problem and say, it's your job to tell me what to do. And that it's also your prerogative to share your ideas first. And lastly, really, just to mention it here, when you, when you simply take at least one or two minutes 
to ask somebody on what their single idea is how to fix this? We have a chance to build their own confidence, especially if they come up with, for example, a, a very good solution. And it might not be ours. Or it might be ours. And in that case, we should be really thankful and proud. So number four, or when coaching is useful, is simply if we suspect that someone's performance is held back not from a lack of skill or knowledge, but from a lack of motivation, focus, confidence, commitment. It simply doesn't work to tell people to, yeah, be motivated. Yeah, how can you do that? You can't can go to somebody who's, who is in a bad mood and say, so cheer up. That doesn't work. It's like trying to calm a toddler down by saying, calm down, be quiet. That doesn't work either. You need to address the actual point. In a coaching situation, we will not ask, what makes you demotivated? But we'll ask, when you are motivated, what is that like? Tell me about a time in the last few weeks or months when you were motivated. When were you different? So our role as a coach is to explore the future where what we want is in place. So just to bring that same idea back, we're not focusing on the past. We might need to do that to vent some air with the person in front of us, but we shouldn't stay there very long. Because let's not forget, the solution doesn't care where the problem came from. So when somebody is stuck in with low motivation, focus, confidence, commitment, coaching is very powerful and motivating. Because very likely people who are in that state also don't feel listened to and they don't feel understood. That's a common theme that I see in all sorts of coaching cases or poor performing teams. The people who are cynical, who are demotivated, who are sort of bad apples, They will say, I feel misunderstood. And unless they are really knowingly sabotaging and so functional sociopaths, they will believe that they are in the right, that they do what they do for the right reasons. When we go with a coaching mindset into a discussion with a person, they often say, you are the first person who listened to me. And that is one of the main ways how coaching helps build trust. Because it makes people feel understood. Simply by using the most basic active listening skills. Which also means holding back on your own opinions. Now, another reason when coaching might be useful is when we have just a few minutes to talk. And to create a coaching moment. It's sort of the flip side of that no earlier. Because coaching does not require a lot of time. It requires asking one question differently and we have a coaching moment. So let's not forget, coaching saves time, but it requires a momentary investment. Coaching is like an amplifier. You invest an X number of time and you save a multiplier of that because people will run and they will ask you less questions in the end because they follow their own acceptable solutions. And that requires really, yeah, that we can apply the coaching mindset in that moment. Number six, when there is trust, coaching is such an accelerator. Because when we believe and we show belief in the capability of our people, and that's especially useful in the beginning of an employee-manager relationship, we radically improve somebody's ability to perform. Now, in the beginning of, let's say a manager hires somebody new, they will have to spend time in advising and training. But in the end, coaching can, can fill a little bit of gaps in the how. So it's always a question of where is the autonomy here? And when we have trust and we look at what autonomy does somebody have, Where could they find a decision or make a decision? They will feel empowered. And let's say you, you go into the first meeting with your uh, new employee. It's your first one-on-one -on -one with them. And you put a sheet of paper in front of them and say, this is your plan to onboard over the next three months. 
these are all the mandatory courses you have to take. These are the people who I really think you should talk to and engage. And I think there is some required way to do it. But I want to also show you that the, the way and the order of how you engage these people is up to you. And also these mandatory courses, they have to be done just within the next four months. It's really up to you when you slot them in. All that has to happen is that they are completed. Now, if you look at this plan, what comes to mind for you? How would you prioritize it and why? And that's really useful. So on two ends. First, you, you exploit the opportunity for autonomy and you pass it on to them. Because you don't want it all just be on your shoulder. You want them to decide how to do it. And you make it very clear to them that they have autonomy. And the second reason is you learn how people think. And you learn how they prioritize. So it's a very surefire way how to really understand how someone works. Then another reason why, why we really might coach is when we are a manager of a highly competent team. Highly functional team. That might be tricky or trickier if we as a manager of that functional team are also highly competent in that functional topic. But it's again, it's here that we want to hold our horses and not, and not micromanage. Coaching is also not delegating. We, we don't want to interfere with our people's work. So when we manage highly competent teams, coaching should be one of the default ways how we approach challenges. Because that's how they grow, that's how they learn, that's how they perform independently. And lastly, I want to share one more thing. When is coaching good? When something good happens. And I cannot stress that enough. So I always train leaders in coaching from wins and challenges. Coaching from wins are so central. Let's say, for example, you approach a team member in passing and say, look, last week I've observed that you've asked 30 minutes in that meeting a really good question. And at that moment, everybody was looking up. I think even James took away his phone. And from that moment, almost things changed. I love that moment. I really wonder how can you do more of that? That was so superb. And you let it stand like that. You don't introduce negative feedback you just stand on that good observation and help someone find a way how to build and expand on that and this coaching is probably the most powerful way how to use that tool because it's very empowering it's positive it passes on autonomy to all people and it helps them build on their strengths so it's something that i unfortunately because of negativity bias in us humans have to reinforce all the time not just in others also in myself you're so drawn to the spectacle of of negativity and things that go wrong and things that go wrong also appear always easier to fix or at least they are more concrete more concrete and discreet some of the most important habits to build is to recognize things that go well and actively coach based on that. So, yeah, so these are some of the reasons when it is useful to coach. And I hope you see there are quite a lot of opportunities here. Let me summarize very briefly. So when there is a liberty and some autonomy to develop a solution, or second, to develop the path to the solution. How will somebody do it? So coaching can focus on the what and on the how. And especially the, the how might be your focus when you as a leader have to tell people what to do. What is the goal? And that's part of our role. So very often our coaching might focus on the, on the how. And well, that's okay. So number three is when there's a chance that the other person or the team member already has an idea on how to approach something. We want to access their ideas. We want to make a bit of space. And that's almost always the case because our team members are experts that's why you hire them number four coaching is also very useful when we suspect that someone is held back from performing due to their lack of motivation focus confidence and commitment number five 
coaching is useful when there is a little bit of time and it's not an absolute crisis. And that takes away sort of a big excuse because there's almost always time to ask one question. What it requires is that we give up a bit of control of the conversation as a leader. And it's rather this, in my opinion, than a lack of time that often prevents us from doing that. Because if we have only five minutes with somebody, we want to often stay in control of those five minutes to make sure we deliver the value, right? In that moment to ask a question feels risky. It's not about the time then, it's about control. Now, number six, coaching is useful when there is trust because coaching is an amplifier of a trusting relationship. It helps on every level to reduce cost and increase speed. Number seven, coaching is very useful when we manage highly competent teams. They don't need to be told what to do. Let's help them develop solutions and get out of their way. And that's a tricky thing for, especially for managers who have functional backgrounds. And lastly, we want to coach especially based on positive observations. When something good happens. And that's also a, a subject for another future episode. How do we share and collect, frankly. First collect and then share good observations. And how do we coach from wins? So I hope this was a useful excursion. I can't believe it took almost 40 minutes to go through this. So again, I have two questions for you that I would like you to consider. Because no good coaching call would be useful without a good question to you. And that's probably the maximum I can do in terms of coaching on this medium. So I wonder, what is the minimum time you can spend in a conversation that's already on your calendar to create a coaching moment? What is the minimum time you can spend in a meeting that is already on a calendar right now to create a coaching moment? And as usual, I will give you 30 seconds here to think about that. And maybe pull out your phone, have a look. What's the next meeting that's coming up? So thank you. So I hope you've found that it doesn't really take much time. It takes a little bit of risk to go out and ask one question where you would otherwise have just placed a statement. And, and the second question I would like to ask you is, in your next meeting with a team member or maybe a peer, in case you are not a manager, what is the kind of liberty and autonomy you can grant them? In terms of the what or the how? Where can you deliberately give autonomy to your people so they can develop ownership? And I want to give you as well 30 seconds on that. Hey, so if you need more time to think, just feel free, pause this podcast. Doing this small exercise is an extremely good investment in your time. So I hope this was a useful summary, despite the fact that it was a bit longer. So we talked about several ways, several reasons when we should not coach. And despite them being so many, there are very good reasons when we can. So coaching has a lot of impact, but we should really focus becoming experts 
in the situational aspect here and wonder, is coaching the right way? Which of my leader styles should I unpack at that moment? So I hope this was useful. Go ahead and apply. Enjoy the next one-on-ones with your team members and I hope you will be able to sneak in a little bit of a coaching moment here and there. All the best and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye. You have been listening to the Coaching Leader Podcast, your resource to activate strengths and coaching skills in leaders. Head over to IntelliCoach.org to check out our blog and offers. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to this podcast and leave a five-star review on iTunes. Thank you for tuning in. Hello and welcome back to... Yeah, just a few more minutes of babbling here. I can't believe you're still around after having listened so long. So hope this is a good thing and it keeps you interested. I was made aware by a friend the other day, yeah, about the nature of these two podcast elements. They are so different, aren't they? The first part being the content, the second part potentially being for a different audience. And I was reconsidering again whether this is a good idea. And I feel like. Yeah, I continue it because I feel like it's, it excites me to have these two components in there. And hopefully, yeah, both audience are overlapping. I think the first thing is I wanted to share again why I chose this topic for this episode. It sort of addresses, in my view, one of the core questions that I get from leader coaches who have sort of understood what coaching really is and now try to figure out how to place it in their actual work life. Now, one of the most important questions they ask, so when should I coach? And the episode today was yeah, a bit of a starting point for that. It didn't go very deep in these elements, but I hope it helped to bring a little bit of clarity in that and clear the fog a little bit in that area. My main point is that we have a lot more opportunity in coaching than we think. And that's especially when we look at coaching not as a whole conversation, but as a coaching moment. And when we believe as a leader coach that all we need to do is look for areas of autonomy. I'm really excited about that and I hope this was a helpful part. Now, the second thing I promise to share about is a bit on the business side numbers so the one thing i've done differently since last week um i think the last time i recorded my numbers was sort of a week ago and since then i've joined as i mentioned this design fundamentals course and really the only place yet where i have where i have shared my new brand intellicoach I'm not gone online yet with it. That's part of 2019 is I've placed the link in the short introduction about myself in a closed Facebook forum. And wow, very strange. I've seen quite an uptick in, in page views to my, to my, uh, to IntelliCoach.org, which I find really interesting. I have no idea where it comes from. So a few days ago, there were 40 page views and today is the 3rd of December. And suddenly I see 90 and it's just a few hours into the day and I have no idea where these people come from and who that is. Well, hopefully that means that's a good indicator. I have no idea yet. And sort of the podcast. So I have eight episodes live at this moment and in total 82 82 views of it. And it's very small, but I'm happy this way. And one reason why I'm happy this way is also because I'm I'm relishing the that part of the journey where I slowly build my competency. And my plan is really to share to my wider friends and colleagues and yeah, and and customers as well what I what I'm planning to do here, which is really get people excited about these coaching skills. And this is something which I plan, yeah, around Christmas and New Year to really go out there. Very early stages yet, but I'll I'll continue that. I know these are very small numbers small starting point but anything is anything anything like that is useful and mailing list for example i haven't even started yet yeah so i've got a lot of 
um, ideas on how to, yeah, how to bring this content to people so they can use it. So my big thing this week, my one thing to share with you as well, is to get ready for ready for a December introduction for of IntelliCoach of this company. And my plan is you know, to s brush up the, the homepage a little bit. So I see that uptick in, uh, in page views and together with that really nice input on the, uh, on the design fundamentals course, I really am keen now to, to bring my message home better. So while well, I'm trying to follow um, a common pain, desire, and solution structure, uh, I'm not very happy about it. Based on a good conversation that I had with another coaching friend, I feel like I'm suffering from imposter syndrome here too. And the funny thing is, I know it, yet I'll stay there, but I think my plan to move out of that is quite clear. And I'm quite in a comfortable place to uh, to finally leave that behind so this was just a short message to you i hope you like this episode until then i wish you all the best and we'll talk again soon bye